So after that introduction, it's going to be really, really hard to get further than that. So if, if we go back to the previous class that had biochem, maybe we, that might be a little bit more <laughs> compelling. Um, thank you, Dr. Ponder. Thank you, Department of Horticulture. Thank you, College of Ag. This is, uh, wow, this, is, uh, this room's changed a lot since I was here. Um, and and I, I've been in your shoes. I sat in your seat, and I saw a lot of people come in and, you know, be in the first week of school or second week of school. I'm just, I'm glad you're here. So thank you, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Um, today I came prepared to kind of talk through a couple of things, and it's, it's going to be a little bit of a grammar test and a little bit of a, a time machine, if you will, uh, just talking about our history and, and how we can kind of connect to where you are now to where I am. Um, but the first thing I must share with you is there's actually an epidemic and uh, it's been going on for years and years. So I hope if you don't take anything away from what I have to share today, at least write this down. This is called the Ing epidemic. The Latin name is Ingus Among Us. Ever since I can remember of founding a company or referring to this industry in general, right? Everybody has always used the verb tense when it should be the noun tense. If you think about it, Gibson Landscape Services is short for a subject. It is a company. It has an identity. Uh, the word landscape itself has an identity. But unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, even people in my own family, they've gotten used to it now, not my direct relatives, because we've, we've disowned them, but they've used the word landscaping when it should be part of the subject. And I want to give you awareness so that if it spreads to other grammar, you'll know where, when to call it and say, you know, go away. So let's not talk like hardscaping, irrigationing, general contractoring. And if you go to that, that building over there on the corner, landscaping architecture. Today, you are actually college studenting. In about 11 days, Hopefully all of us will be enjoying footballing. And if we don't win seven games this year, we're going to be doing a lot of... <laughs> okay. So about a year ago, we, we embarked on rebranding our company identity. It was like 18 years old. We said, hey, it's probably time for us to kind of get re-in-touch with who we are, uh, growing up as you will. So we... We searched, and this was the definition. If you Google Wikipedia, this is kind of the second one down, but we felt like it had the most meaning about the physical origin and the cultural overlay. It gives, it gives a lot of purpose to what it is that we do as a company both as, and as an industry. Um, you know, if you think about it in this business, we're agents for change. And, uh, you know, we, we, we take raw materials, we harvest them from different sources and bring them together, assemble them, and we recreate what, what happens a lot of times in nature. So we felt like that the synthesis between people and place was a really, really strong binding factor to what it is that we are as a company and as an industry. When you think about the word transform, it's in the verb tense. And the two words that kind of jump out in that grammar as well is change and form. Anybody in here in design or horticulture or anybody studying right now? Everybody? Just wanted to make sure. So I, I'm biased because I feel like the landscape has a very, very unique position. If you think about the assets of the world, what happens in nature, and we get to, em we get to emulate that and do it for people and create space, I think it's a very, very unique position as designers, as contractors, we create things that last generational. You know, outside of the home where we raise our families and we fall in love and we have kids and we go through all those things lost, outside of that, the landscape has really got, it, it probably has the most value, at least, at least in my opinion, my humble opinion. There was an architect who uh, founded, and he's the current chairman emeritus of Hart and Howerton, a uh, Harvard-educated man. Um, some of his works that you might be familiar with is Nashville's Metro Center, the Callaway Gardens. He master planned Buena Vista City at uh, Disney World and the design of the East Coast homes for the Disney family. He once said, and I quote, I will not hire any United States-based architects. 
because they have, quote unquote, not been taught how to draw. He went on further to say, and this was to a close friend of mine, which is kind of a neat context when you think about the ability of an architect to design things and usually they carry their own gusto with having that authority. But he said this, I'm a planner by vocation and an architect by necessity, but make no mistake, all architecture in its very nature is bad because it superimposes the man-made on the divine. So the best we can hope for is for us to plant the hell out of it and hide our mistakes. That's a pretty humble comment from an architect, especially one with that caliber. Talking about horticulture, what I studied here at Auburn uh, being the framework, as well as design, um, it gives us a, a unique ability to transform. And we take these, these moments to, to share and put in good practice that, again, I said generationally, so you can think about maintenance companies coming in service in a good property that was well designed, good plant placement, good separation, you know, picking the right plant material. It's gonna have a legacy that'll last for generations. The challenge to this industry, and I'll go ahead and tell you, you can't sugarcoat it, right? It's a pretty low qualifier for entry. I mean, I, I was a 12 year old kid, they got a lawnmower and I could officially say I was a landscape in contractor um, but there is a low cost there's a low qualification so the quest for all of us is, as contractors designers as people in this industry we have to create differentiation but we also have to, 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 to create something that's like a market following so that people can see hey this guy operates differently so we'll touch on a little bit of that but I want to talk about the history kind of like where I was if I rewind the clock like 18 years ago um, one, one safeguard, to, if I can stress to you today, is if you're into this industry, if you're, if you're going to follow the design path, watch out for what I call sap suckers, and I'll, I'll clarify that in a minute. Everybody here know what a sap sucker is? A little bird that eats all the way around the, the tree ends up killing it. So in the beginning, uh, as a company, we would, we would take on any work because it was me, and I had to like, have a live with it. So if it meant digging up asphalt in the parking lot, if it meant pulling weeds behind grocery stores, if it meant whatever you can imagine, we had to take it because that, that was a, a means of income. Uh, my business card was, was predominantly displayed in two local nurseries that were in Jonesboro, one of which I actually worked at, and I'll, I'll allude to the, to the connection here in a little bit, but I actually worked at during high school years and it kind of gave me the inspiration to do what we do now. Um, in the beginning, once we got out of just the, the call of somebody buying a pallet of sod and saying, hey, um, this guy, call Tony, he's an Auburn grad, but he'll lay the sod for you. When we grew out of that, it became, you know, the design side followed along with me and I could use that as a means of securing work. And basically, it, it, you know, it, as, as opposed to being a direct line of income on the design side, I could use that as a way to, to separate myself from our competition. And if you think of like marketing and sales, you know, we want to create a brochure that's appealing. We want graphics that are appealing. What better way to show an owner, you know, what you intend for their, for their location and their future than a plan that's designed and colored and for them. So uh, the design builds were, were, years were very, very successful for us. Um, one example of that was, um, for instance, one of the one of the many that we've did that we did back in that time um, was a project called Kingsborough Park, and it was actually a referral from somebody else that uh, had met a developer. It ended up being a ten-year relationship, but I won the work because I stayed up all night, like many of you that have been in design, stayed up all night and colored on our dining room table, which is now my mother-in-law's house. But you can still go to her house today and look at that same design that's still colored. <laughs> Unfortunately, it ate through the varnish on the, on the, <laughs> on the table. Um, again, about transformation, you, it, it, it's hard to kind of capture 18 years, but the, you got to understand there was the very initial beginning that was like, it was just whatever, to the second phase, which was growing a relationship, realizing that I can't be in front of every homeowner, so it's best to like find somebody that does this stuff for a living. So then I could sell the design build side as well 
but it was oftentimes negotiated. It was doing a lot of other things, but it was like one, one guy, you know, I'm, I'm 26 years old and he gives me a half million dollar project. And I'm like, wow, what did he, you know, what did he see in me? But I had to make sure that we delivered. So we went from that and you know, again, good success for seven, eight years to the expansion. We moved to Huntsville in March of 2006, Birmingham in April of 2007. And then in 2008, we opened a Northside office in Atlanta just to get closer to our clients and also spread the maintenance work. Um, but we grew for reasons that I'll discuss later were not necessarily the best. Um, our, our, our scope started to grow. And what I also figured out, if you look, you'll hear like this constant um, consolidation of clients. So what happens is you get one good relationship that people trust you, and then all of a sudden you just want to do more business with that person. And if they can have, you know, more governance over bigger work or you can include more scope that's complementary. So what happened to us is we started taking on hardscape opportunities. And that's always fascinated me, me because it's, it, it frames what it is that we do. Plus all the people that were doing it were tearing up my landscape when it would go in. So it was kind of frustrating at the same time. So we just said, hey, maybe there's a need for somebody to kind of own the process. And we first initially did it with a job at, at Emory University. And it, it went really good, to be honest with you. It was with a sub that we thought, hey, let's go do this again. You know, this kind of common sense approach, right? Uh, well, the bad news was in 2009, Anybody remember like 08, 09, that kind of stuff? I'm sure you hadn't heard that before, but um, we had to become very narrow focused because all of a sudden, all the residential stuff stopped. All the stuff, you know, regional to Atlanta had just disappeared. And with that went our subcontractor who had five projects that we had under binding agreement with him, he went out of business. And so here we are at this defining moment and you say, man, that's really smart. How are you doing hardscape, landscape, all this grading and site work and, and growing the maintenance at the same time? And we went into 2009 with a month and a half worth of backlog, which well, I explained it earlier. What you know, just general backlog means how long you're gonna you're gonna have work to keep guys busy, and that's that's not a lot of work in a in a in a good economy. It's really really bad in a bad economy when nobody else is adding new work or new projects. So we had to narrow. But at the same time, we had to start expanding to other markets. Um, one thing I want you to remember that, that design in and of itself, although you, you may be studying the, the production side, you may look at yourself as more of an operator, you may say, hey, I only want to do maintenance, but it's all framed around design. And it is a constant, especially in this industry that's framed by nothing but quality. I mean, if you think about it, somebody, one person takes a picture of a tree, and then another person takes a picture of a tree. And they, they can meet the spec. They can both be three inch. They can both be a certain height. They can both meet caliper and, and all the botanical requirements. But you guys know what looks good and what doesn't, right? Well, the, the challenge of it is, is if you don't adhere yourself to quality, even though it's going to cost more, you'll develop that reputation on the other side, which is something you, you just can't recover from. So the, 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 the end story of that chapter of our life was basically we became laser focused and we grew our territory, which, um, you know, I'm very grateful for. It was tough. It was tough years trying to figure it out. Um, but here we are. So we now know what we want to be when we grow up 18 years later. Um, so what that is, is we're laser focused on who our market is and, and we're a bid build with negotiated work. That means we'll price it at a great value but we want to negotiate that work through a relationship, people that trust, right? Design creative is always universal to, to any kind of business. If you think about processes and being successful, it's just it's coming up with ways to get better and to be better. And you have to be a consummate advocate for improvement. If you want to do it, if you want to hear the bad news, then you got to start asking the questions. Um, and make sure that you differentiate yourself. So these are all roles that if you're studying horticulture, you may end up going into, you may design, that may be your thing. But I put all these up here because every single one of them has something to do with design. Like what is good quality? What is, what is something that is perceived to be a good value? And what, what will deliver something that's enduring? So 
think about it on the purchasing side. If you're going to pick plants and you need to find something that has good quality, that comes from the design, knowing when and where to plant the right plant material. So there's a lot of career avenues and people that have been very successful doing a lot of these positions, either specialized or in a general format. Um, but the thing is, is you'll always have that foundation for design. This comes to like the second part, kind of the middle of what we wanted to talk about being the network. Uh, Dr. Ponder talked about like very humble beginnings, which we really did. A lot of people would assume if, if you went to our website or you saw our jobs or saw our, our, our vehicles or any of that promotional stuff, if you saw any of that, you would, you would, you would make the assumption, hey, well-connected, knew a lot of people, grew up country club, Rolodex must have been, daddy knew somebody. That's not, that's not really where it started. Um, I had five introductions. And if I put these names up here, they don't really mean a whole lot to y'all unless, unless y'all are relatives and we, then we can talk and I'll buy you lunch later or dinner. But these people, while we don't necessarily still do business with them, they all led to one other introdu introduction. And that's really what life's about. Careers change, people change, circumstances change. If you do something right for somebody and they, they have that trust, that currency that we trade in, right, is trust. Just like, just like a bank account, you can overdraw your account and lose trust, and you can work hard to gain it back. But if you think about these five people, the first one was a grading contractor that, that did some work for my dad that um, actually handed my card over, and I'd known since I was a little kid, who made the introduction to the guy on the end who was a developer of a multi-site kind of deal going in Atlanta, also Huntsville, which took us to Huntsville. Gordon Dorsey was a graduate, 1984. 84. Graduate of horticulture here, who went back home. His dad owned the nursery that I ended up hanging my, you know, my business card in. Right, Glenn Dorsey, it was Dorsey's nursery in Lovejoy, Georgia. Rob Ward was the roommate to my best friend here at Auburn, who also studied horticulture. But Rob Ward uh, was a building science major, and he went to work for a large general contractor who also introduced me to another guy at Auburn. I mean, there's, there's, there's like three people already from Auburn. And y you might see a little theme, but in a market like Atlanta, people are looking for somebody to identify because all they run around and talk about is those stinking dogs, and they can't spell it right, and all you hear is dog, dog, dog. So, so we're just, we're hungry to like find our own family. So that ought to be one clue. And again, it, it was very, it was very uh, amazing. So like I said, people are dynamic, careers are dynamic. Once you do something good for somebody, they'll introduce you to somebody else and then they'll spread off and they'll go to five places and they're spread. It's like having apostles. Like we don't spend anything on marketing. We did a website and rebranding. That was the first time we did anything in 18 years of significance. Like of putting money towards that. The rest has been word of mouth. So um, you just got to be ready when an opportunity shows up. And you got to make sure the most important part is you got to perform. So you can get invited to the dance, but you got to make sure that you perform and take those opportunities. People sometimes just blow those off and think, I'll get it, I'll get another time, I'll get another chance. Well, there, you know, even a city as big and a region as big as the southeast they're still, it's a very, very small group of folks. And, the, you know, if you can take one other thing besides the ing, ingus among us, away from here, people will always do business with those that they want to do business with. Like, it, again, goes back to trust. So, um, if you want to talk about the what, like what is it that we do as a company, uh, the services that we offer today. As we grew up, we're now what we are and this is what we do. Landscape, hardscape, water feature, green roof construction, landscape maintenance. I could talk and spend a minute about our market advantage, but a lot of that honestly is kind of stuff we've already talked about. The best thing you can know is that when you distill it all down, trust is the foundation for employees, people. We, this, the, the tagline that you saw at the beginning was something that was kind of a neat evolution for us because it People in place was kept reoccurring in my mind. And then the uniting part, you know, people are both customers and employees. 
you know, if you're the CEO or president, you don't hire people, your people hire you. And if they're quitting on you, then they're firing you. And so we have to, we have, to have that view of yourself and awareness once you get to that, to that point. Um, so our market advantage is all of this. If you had anything to take away, it's the do say principle. You know, we have to deliver on our promises. Otherwise, it doesn't take long. What we came up with was our purpose is the creation of remarkable value in enduring landscapes. Remarkable is, is, is one of the key words for us because it's worthy of mentioning again. It gives value, but remarkable doesn't mean you have to be expensive, although you know, we can't, we're not going to be the cheapest. Good value and remarkable value means you're willing to tell others about it, that it's good enough, good enough that people are going to understand, hey, that looks good, or you drive to a site, that looks awesome. I don't know who did it. That looks awesome. And so a lot of us can identify with that. Enduring landscapes, hey, we, we just want to be able to say, hey, I planted that tree. I mean, look at the legacy of Dr. Ponder, and, and the, the, we were talking about the senior staff, Dr. Gillum and Dr. Kiever. Look at what all they've planted in us. And you don't think they're proud, and they look back and they go, you know, I had, I had help in molding that. So just, you know, it's something that enduring is just a really, really all-encapsulating important word along with remarkable. Our promise, the promotion of physical and cultural good, and then again, living synergy. Most importantly, we want to provide value in life by honoring what we've been given. So we have to be stewards. We can't take money, projects, assignment, people, can't take them for granted. Um, and by doing that, I think you know, it's honoring and uh, glorifying to God. So I'll talk about the virtues, and I, I, I don't really like going too deep into this because it's like he's a virtuous person. Here he is standing from. This is not preaching, I promise. I just I think it's important enough to bring up when you talk about growth, when we talk about being a part of an industry that's very dynamic and transformative. So of the four that are listed, if you read them on our website, the two I highlighted are the first two. Honoring our commitments. Again, the do-say principle, we have to carry that out every day. But it's not just me. It's got to be our people. And so we've, we've established a value system test, the same one, coincidentally, that Chick-fil-A uses for their 16, 17, 18-year-olds that get them to say, when you say thank you, they say, brother, my pleasure. Okay. And if you can get a 17-year-old to say, my pleasure, you're doing something. So... The other thing is taking extreme ownership. You know, hey, admit it. If, if you make a mistake, we kind of, we, you know, we don't just incompetently walk around and say, oh, I did that wrong, oh, I did that wrong, oh, I did that wrong. But we're in a culture where we've got to be authentic to one another. And so if we're going to have extreme ownership, like, hey, I, we keep close checks of one another as colleagues. We just say, you know, hey, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't pull that off. You know, we don't try to sweep it under the rug. And that's prevalent in a lot of cultures. So you you'll find that customers will immediately go to you for repeat business and, and referral business if they know they can trust you and they see you own it. So that's a big part. Um, being somebody that people can count on is just, is, is just really good business. And you know, more importantly, we want to be good citizens. Just a couple of lists to remain humble. So Mark Conklin, um, a guy with Chick-fil-A, an executive with Chick-fil-A, used this expression at a leadership conference I was at about a month ago. And uh, he used the expression, standing out by stepping down. And, he, and I won't get into it. I've, I've put a couple examples. I know we're short on time. I don't want to go into the too deep of a story. But if, you, if I could recommend a book today, it would be to go pick up a book written by Truett Cathy. And you just look at that culture, you know, here it is, a guy in a suit and a tie. He's the executive of the company, $4 billion company. And he'll, when he's walking the parking lot, he's picking up trash. And so if you think about servant leadership, two people in my life who Truett Cathy happened to be my, my Sunday school teacher when I was at Jonesboro First Baptist growing up. <laughs> Honestly, it, it didn't really like impact me as much as I thought. We always, at 13 years old, thought he was the chicken guy, you know, just, but 
but look at what a magnificent business they've built. And then the other person is my grandfather. So if you write, if you want to look down or write down, excuse me, um, True Kathy for a book, and then Google search Grover Cannon story, or just Grover Cannon and then life story. That's 40 minutes that I assure you, you probably have the moment when you're driving home or at some point just to listen. It's, an, it's a very remarkable story about how somebody lived through faith and, uh, I mean, impacted my life tremendously. So um, the next thing, staying on the subject of humble or remaining humble in humility, uh, this, is, this is written by... Stephen Pressfield, who wrote the book Gates of Fire. It's an epic novel of the Battle of Thermopylae. Anybody seen the movie 300 or Spartacus or anybody know? Come on. Okay. If not, I'll read the whole book. I, I, I've got, I'm just kidding. I will read this with, without apology, though. And what, ha what happened is the king of Persia is getting thumped, and these 300 soldiers from Sparta are just beating him up every time they attacked. So he sent, a, he sent a, a, a spy in, a servant, and said, go find out what's going on down there and why we're getting beat every single time. This happened repeatedly. So he asked him, he said, what is it about their king? Describe for me what it is that they're doing that we're not. He came back and told the Persian king, he said, a king does not abide within his tent while his men bleed and die upon the field. A king does not dine while his men go hungry, nor sleep when they stand at watch on, upon the wall. A king does not command his men loyalty through fear, nor purchase it with gold. He earns their love by the sweat on his back, and the pain he endures for their sake. That which compromises the harshest burden, a king lifts first and sits down last. A king does not require service of those he leads, but provides it to them. A king does not expand his substance, to enslave men, but by his conduct and example makes them free. As Stephen Pressfield for the Gates of Fire. That kind of sets sort of a, a picture, if you will, of what a leader really should be. As a company, we've embraced the core values of dedication, service, quality, and integrity something I think you have to live out, but the one that, that I wanted to, to jump in on today is dedication with the words commitment, remarkable, and long-term. You can get riches, success, and do a lot of things in a quick short term, but it's only long-term and, and staying committed to the task and keeping a broader view of the big picture um, do, I think, do I think you have real meaningful success. Just a little bit about our audience. Like, again, back to that network piece that, you know, what do we want to be when we grow up? We work for architects, owners, property managers, all in the commercial space. We prefer to negotiate and through referral. That's just like where we want to be. Um, I didn't know that growing up as I came out of school and uh, first embarking. But 90% of our business today is by referral. Which, or repeat customer, which is tremendous. And right now, we're, we're, we're in a kind of an uptick on our piece of the market, and we're saying no. Um, and I, it's for reasons that I'll, I'll explain later. So, this is the part where I show you some pretty pictures, and if I was to end and say I was the 12-year-old kid who grew up in the trailer park, at the age of 12, Dad said, if you want to start, if you want to pay for a car, I wouldn't start a business. If you want to pay for a car, but if you're at 12, you, that's like that's like a century away. Like I'm telling, I'm trying to tell, I, and I sort of joke, but I tell my 13-year-old like, get the, the the dishes out of the dishwasher, and it's like, anyways. So I cut 200 yards, and and then had the experience of knowing what it was like to earn a dollar, spend a dollar, have friends that wanted to mooch off of me because I had a car, but I saved up enough and bought a vehicle. So that's the part where you, you say, okay, that's a Cinderella story. That's where he started. This is where it's at, 150 people. And you go, man, that's awesome. We could end, we could take questions, but that would not be the most authentic thing I could do. Because in that, and in my transformation, 
of going from where I was to where we are, I have to tell you the backstory. And maybe some of you have experienced some of this. I don't, you know, I'll, I'll give my card out if you want to ever talk, call, email me. 1986, my dad had two loans with the First Bank of Knoxville, developing um, two hotels, one in Jackson, Tennessee, one in Knoxville. Two million dollar loans. At the time of the savings and loan crisis, there was no such thing as FDIC or any guaranteed deposits. Basically, we had a market shift. Interest rates were like 18%. And basically, everybody took all their money out and put it in, you know, took it out of the deposits. And so banks were collapsing. There was 900 plus banks across the, south, across the country um, that collapsed. And so the, the bank that loaned my dad the $2 million for the two projects went bankrupt. And that's, that's like really bad, especially when you're under construction. So long story short of that is we lost everything. Like, and nobody sat down and said, hey, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> you're 11, so you don't really, you're 10, 11 years old, you don't really know what's going on. We just lost everything. People came to repossess cars. Our home was gone. Like, you know. So here it is. We moved to Jonesboro. My dad takes a job with my grandfather to develop a 250-acre mobile home park. And my dad would always correct me and say, it's manufactured home. <laughs> it's only a trailer if it has wheels underneath it. <laughs> um, and a hitch, right? So at that point, if you, if you want to look at the silver lining about things, look at the blessing that was created because we moved to a neighborhood that has ample amount of yards. And believe it or not, even in a mobile home park, people don't want to cut their own grass. There's 10 units per acre, which is a tremendous amount of density. And if you time that, that's, six, that's 30 bucks an hour because I could cut one, I could cut one yard in 30 minutes. So, you know, 30 bucks an hour in 1986. And I took this picture a couple of years ago, so you know, bear with me. It's it's aged a little bit, but that's the home I grew up in. And it's like, you can see I had a little bit to prove, right, when it comes to landscape and being able to make it as a contractor. So if you fast forward through all that, 96, I interned, as Dr. Ponder mentioned, and uh, got an opportunity to see what a real enterprise for a landscape company was. I mean, I knew what grass cutting meant, I knew what a dollar meant, but to scale and to look at a $20 million multi-regional company that was in five or six different markets at that time, I was like, holy crap. And the thing about it, they weren't doing a whole lot different than what I'd already learned when I was 12. So, of course, the ambition part of me said, that's what I want. So in 1998, I sold everything I had. I had 10 grand. Part of it was the 900 or $700 that I had from graduation and then nine grand that I got for selling a car. Um, within 60 days, I bought the house, got married, had a business. So, very humble beginnings. Um, fast forward to 2009. This is kind of another chapter of the, of the networking story, but um, the five projects I, 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 we were talking about, subcontractor disappearing, it's like, it, 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 it's getting ugly. So, we got, we got stuck with a lot of stuff. But it was only until July of 2011. Now, you think about it, that's like two year period between nine when we had no backlog and, and then we're doing work and we're traveling. But the problem is we, we, we still lost money in nine and 10. Cash is always a lag indicator. I won't get into too much economics, but basically uh, I was at the point when somebody for the first time in 13 years of business came to me and said, we're not gonna make payroll next week. Now. Naturally, I thought, hey, I started a business, no big deal, had 10 grand. Uh, we got to where we're at, that's not, that's not, you know, we'll find a way. But there were things that led up to this. Savings got depleted, more, more things in reserves got depleted, a lot of things were going wrong that I thought I needed to control. I thought I needed to be the one like juggling all the balls. And, and for a long time, 12 years in my own career, I did that. I said, oh, we need to be in Birmingham. Oh, we need to be in Huntsville. And I might have prayed about it, ladies and gentlemen, but it was, I promise you, I didn't wait for an answer. 
I'd bow my head for 30 seconds, it seems like. It certainly wasn't long enough. But I prayed about those things, and it was still my own will, wanting those to happen. Well, all that came home to roost July 7, 2011, when I was told there's no way out. Some people know what it is to hit rock bottom. I didn't think I was going to have that happen at 37 years old. Um, but I, I thought of it as a big deal, like we've never had this issue before. So I spent three days in prayer, and on that third day, I just, I said, I can't do it anymore. So part of what we talk about transforming is really a subject and a result of the transformation that's happened with our company and our people. And when somebody says, payroll's not met next Tuesday and you need $150,000, that's a lot of money. And if you don't know where it's coming from, that's really scary. But when you're on your knees and you say, I can't do this anymore. The amazing thing about all of that is not only am I standing here to tell you what we've come through and what we are now, but at that exact moment that I turned my phone back on, I had an email from my office manager who went by the office on a Saturday and said, there was a $200,000 check in the mailbox on Saturday. So it's like, here it is. I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't 30 seconds after I had said, I can't do this anymore, that that need was met. And so since that moment, five years, we've had, and we've tripled, we've had five years of profit growth and top line growth equal of 20% per year. But better than that, we've tripled our earnings from the whole prior 12 years prior, from 1998 to 2011, we've tripled the earnings in the last five years, just since that moment. Talk about standing out by stepping down. It took me 12 and a half, 13 years to realize I needed to stand down. Since then, we relocated our corporate headquarters. Um, I didn't bring a picture of that today, but you know, it, it, it's a remarkable turnaround. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip through some slides. Y'all see the work, and we'll take questions and, and uh, kind of go from there. So the cool thing about this, the, the rest of this work is 100% done by our people. There is no asterisk next to it that says, hey, we didn't put in the pool coping. We didn't put in the hardscape. Like everything you see in these pictures are our guys, our craftsmen traveling to do this stuff. Um, so, that's Nashville, isn't it? Uh, this one, this one's Nashville. That's the park um, that we just finished, the the Ascend Amphitheater. That's the Omni Hotel next to the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville. That's uh, Duke University Learning Center which was a $4 million project. That, that What's cool about this, there's a water feature you can't really see. It has like 300 feet of stainless steel runnel that drops down. It basically captures all the rain leaders off the building, goes into a cistern. By the time it goes through three or four bioswells, you could drink the water on the other side. I didn't do it, but that's what, that's what everybody else said. That's another picture of that same area. So you can see the fountain and the runnels dropping down. Duke, you know, not a big ACC fan myself, but they're, they own the rights to their own stone. If you think of the cathedral, the chapel, sorry, that's at Duke, which is right there, they actually own the quarry. I don't know how many years ago, and they sell it to every contractor that goes to their projects for $500 a ton. Yeah, it's, it's like, welcome to North Carolina. Uh, that's another project at Duke. It's the open space. That was, at the time, was the largest um, open space project on the eastern seaboard. Cancer Center, DMP, College of uh, Oncology. Uh, Jekyll Island Conference Center, and then that's Piedmont Park. We, we planted uh, 300, four, almost 400 trees. That's, uh, that's an office building we just did with the water feature and stuff. So again, I, there's, there's quite a few of these. Fort Benning job, design build, 56 foot tall water wall. Ask me how many of those I had before this job. Right. Scared me to death. But we did it. 
our guys had scaffolding all the way up and stacked all, every bit of that stone natural. I mean, it's natural stone, all stacked. That's, uh, that's the amphitheater. This is the park, dog park, botanical garden down this way. That's the Cumberland River. That's the world headquarters for ADP. More Nashville. And that's a turtle. All right. <laughs> so grammar review is there's the transform by the verb tense as well as by the noun tense. All right. Questions? Questions for Tony? What do you want to know? Yes, go ahead. What do you BS and horticulture. Landscape. Everything that we've done. Um, hired people that knew the stuff. Yeah, so that, that's part of that being authentic is knowing, you know, like when not. Now, I'm on the pricing pre-con end a lot, so um, you can learn it on paper pretty, well, not pretty quick. It, it, this is actually a slow cycle. It takes years to kind of get really good at it, but you can see it on paper for a while, and if you got good people that can execute in the field, um, that makes all the difference. So yeah, we certainly wouldn't be self-performing if those subs hadn't have disappeared and, and we didn't have qualified people because all that time, like all the financial things were not because we messed up jobs. It's because I didn't know how to price them. And so it took two years or so to kind of get learned, like be, be educated in that business. Yeah, it was such a short time span, though. Like from a from a large scale side, it it, uh, it it's certainly not as diff it's different than having the dynamic of having that person in your office. Like they care, they're only working on your job, and so if you run into them in the office, we're talking about our. It's like family. It's like family versus, you know, just hiring somebody because you have that that bond of trust. So. Um, yeah, I'd say more of the education is just by having the right employees. How many employees? 150. Uh, it's actually, we're doing the Braves Stadium, as Dr. Ponder mentioned. It's probably it, it's grown since then, but on an average, about 150. 150 employees. Yes. That's a good question. Um, you know. I never thought, it's like he said, I, I guess I just never thought twice. My, my dad's dad owned a grocery store, an IGA, which oddly enough, I always thought the G stood for Gibson. It's like independent grocers. <laughs> that wasn't ego. I, just, I was just too young to know any different. Um, but he had, he had three food stores, and then my grandfather started his own business, which uh, another remarkable story about humility, he just, at the end, 100 plus million dollar enterprise and still wore the same shoes, lived in the same 1950s ranch. Like, it didn't change anybody. Or, and, his, and him or his wife, my grandparents, they were just. So I had those two examples, I think. And uh, I do know that when I showed up from Auburn in the driveway, I went and bought a weed eater and a backpack blower with some of that money. And they, my parents, like, said, <laughs> You were serious. <laughs> and I think they were seeing like, we just spent this for his education and he's going to go cut grass. <laughs> so, good question. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, probably not on that operational side, but just the, just the what Michael Gerber refers to as the uh, entrepreneurial seizure. I think that was just in my DNA. Like seeing that that's the way they've always lived, that it just, it was comfort. It was, I don't know, it just seemed natural. Good question, though. The biggest help? Um, yeah, no, I, I think the network was always looking for that next connectivity was very important and we live in a market fortunately like I was here 
and one of my colleagues said, hey, I'm going to start a business too. Why don't we do it together? And his, his parents were well connected. Dad was a CPA, his mom was a head nurse at a very well-known doctor's group and hospital. And they, and I was like, I was, I was just like astonished. I was like, man, that would be awesome. Why don't we, you know, so we talked about it. We talked about partnering. I was gonna end up in Birmingham. The best part of advice my dad ever gave was look, you can do, you can do exactly what you wanna do. He said, but if you're here in Atlanta, I know I can help you more. And this is such a wealth of just connectivity and people and network. And I didn't see that in the beginning. I thought, hey, you got to have this status or that doctor's connection or, you know, my first goal was like to sell 150 grand in a year, which, you know, we kind of got there on a prorated basis. But um, I would say the network and having those people around me were the best. Let's give Tony a hand.